Good morning, church. How good is the Lord? And God is here. He showed up this morning. He's going to continue just to speak to us. If you're, if you're new this morning, my name is Adam. I'm the pastor here. Man, we are, we are thrilled that you've joined us this morning. You've chosen to worship with us. If you are new, uh, just go over to this next steps right over here after service. We'll have to get some stuff in your hand and uh, just get to know you. Um, let's, um, I just want to deal with uh, Hurricane Ian and what came through uh, this past week. You know, we have an opportunity as a church to make a difference uh, in the families and the people who have been affected by this storm. And I believe that we can put love into action. Amen. We have the love of God and we can put into action. So we try to get the word out the best we could. You may not have heard of that, heard, heard what, we, what we put out, but we're gonna, uh, everyone who was able to hear uh, brought a, uh, a case of water bottles and we're taking those cases of water bottles you brought today down this afternoon to the Fort Myers area. Uh, one thing that we've learned, uh, I've learned through some conversations with, with different people and organizations and stuff is one of the biggest things that they need right now is water because um, the water is, is cut off. It won't be back on for another two weeks in some areas. And so uh, that is just a simple way that we can uh, help those communities and level those communities and uh, some supplies. We also had a list, and many of you brought granola bars, some different things too as well. And so thank you for being a part of that. Uh, also, I want to make you aware that I had a conversation with a pastor uh, is Living Hope Church down in uh, Fort Myers yesterday, and he was just kind of telling me, about what is happening in his community. Some pretty heartbreaking stuff. The, the church that he ministers to around in the surrounding areas, uh, there's 300 different homes in his community. And 250 out of 300 homes were utterly, just completely destroyed. When I put myself in those shoes, you know, he was saying that 90% of the families around in the, in the areas don't have power yet. Uh, thankfully, the church does have power. I guess they got that to them uh, is w uh, quicker than, than, than other ones. Uh, but 90% of the people don't have power, and the whole entire infrastructure is, is destroyed in his community. Which he told me, he goes, I think this is going to be over a month before we're even able to, to have power into some of these homes. And that it will be two weeks before water's even uh, cut back on. And so... I asked the pastors, like, hey, what can, what can we do for you? Because a lot of our families are just kind of caring for their particular family to get their stuff in order. And so what I told them, I was like, hey, I would love to bring a team down uh, next Sunday. And so what we would like to do is if you are able, it's going to be a, a local missions trip. If you are able physically in body, uh, we're going to leave uh, next Sunday around 4.30. We'll get you the exact details here soon. There's going to be some stuff posted online. Leave around 4.30 next Sunday and return late Thursday night. So we'll spend four days down there just helping with anything that, that we possibly need. And so if you would like to be a part of that, if you were able, uh, your body's able to, to withstand, it's going to be strenuous. It's not going to be an easy trip. Uh, it's not going to be something that is a cakewalk. Like we're going to be out doing hard manual labor, chainsaws, like the whole, the whole thing. Like so if you're able to do that, want to be a part, um, let us know. You can, if you have my number, you're welcome to text me. You can email me, adam at journeychurch.org, and we'll be able to get some information to you. And we'll also post it online, and you can fill out a form and be a part of that. But you know what? I mean, there are many people going to help. But we can be a part of that. Us just doing something small, like the water this, uh, uh, during service today and, and taking it down this afternoon and us going to these communities and loving on this particular area, we're part of a bigger picture of the kingdom of God coming together to love on these communities. And what a beautiful, incredible thing it can be. So this is how we're going to respond. We're going to put our love into action. We're going to care for people and love on uh, thankfully, we didn't get hit like that, and the Lord spared our community, but I mean, there's so many people, when you look at, again, if you look at those pictures, you look at the video, what's happening going on down there, my heart really breaks, and so if you want to be a part of that, would love for you just to, uh, to hit us up and let us know, and uh, there'll be stuff posted online for you to fill out a form. Can we just pray for uh, those communities, Fort Myer area, Tampa, all the families and people who were affected Lord, we, um, 
We know that you're sovereign over everything, Jesus, and sometimes things happen that we don't really fully understand, but God, it's an opportunity for your church to arise up and to make a difference, God, into the lives of other people. God, you've called us to serve. God, you came to serve, not to be served, and give your life as a ransom, and God, we can simply just serve you in a way of just bringing water today and different supplies and uh, going down and to help people, God. And so, Lord, I pray that, God, you would even just show people if that's something they need to do next week, that, Lord, that you would uh, just show them right now, Father God, and that would be something that they step in to do and have the courage to do it, God. So, Lord, I pray for those families, God, and just as we're talking about rebuilding the, the walls of Nehemiah, in Nehemiah's day, God, I pray for those communities that have been affected, God. I pray that you would just help those families to supernaturally build, just as you supernaturally built those walls in just 52 days. And so, God, we declare, God, restoration. God, we declare that your love is going to be made known. And, Lord, this is going to be a time for the church to rise up and to make a difference in the lives of others. And so, Lord, we thank you, Father God. Just restore hope and joy in those communities, Father God. Every need would be, be, able, would be met. And, uh, Lord, we thank you for that. And we're just grateful for the opportunity to be a part of it. And everyone said this morning, amen. Amen. So we are concluding our series next week on supernatural building. And in two weeks, we're starting a new series on the fruit of the Spirit. And the idea behind this new series that's going to be starting on the fruit of the Spirit is we want to walk in the fruit of the Spirit Some of us, we're going after our spiritual giftings before we begin to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, and sometimes we got it all backwards, you know what I'm saying? That we need to have love, joy, peace, kindness, self-control, faithfulness, gentleness, right? We need to be people who walk in that, and I'm thankful for my spiritual gift, but man, if we can't walk in in the fruits of the Spirit, we're missing something. We're going to go into our spiritual giftings in a series next year, but I believe and know that God's called us into a series of just talking about the fruits of the Spirit. So may we be people who walk in the fruits of the Spirit. So two weeks, come back, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, Last week, we shared this in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, that the people came together. They were celebrating the building of these walls and happened in just 52 short days. We've said this over and over again. I even prayed. It, it happened in 52 days, which is nothing short of supernatural. You know when the Holy Spirit is up to something, he does it supernaturally. That's why it's supernatural. Jerusalem tried to build the walls for over 52 days, but they're able to do it supernaturally uh, for over 70 years. They're able to do it supernaturally in just 52 days. And so they're celebrating this incredible move of God in their life. And Ezra, he opens the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and he begins to read. And the people, they receive what he's reading. You know how when you're reading the word of God and all all of a sudden it just jumps off the pages? Isn't that a beautiful, wonderful, incredible thing? This is what's happening in the lives of these people. It's like the rhema word in that moment, which means this becomes alive to them. And what happens, they begin to weep. From the word of God, they literally begin to weep, and they're turning from their sin. We said last week that in order to have personal revival, because what's happening in this text in in Nehemiah chapter 8 is personal revival. It's a revival that is happening, and we said this, that we need to have clean hands, a pure heart, and we need to turn from our idols, amen? Clean hands, turn from our sin, a pure heart, come before the Lord with a pure, authentic heart, and we need to turn from our idols, turn from the things that we've put ahead of God in our life. We all have them. And so we did that last week. And so as the people did that in Nehemiah's day, they turned from their idols, repented, turned back to God. As they began to weep and cry, Ezra and Nehemiah, they corrected the people and they said, listen, do not sorrow. This is our text for today, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Do not sorrow. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. They're saying, hey, listen, you get it. You understand it. Stop weeping. Stop crying. I'm glad you're turning from your sin. But listen, the joy of the Lord is your strength. What I believe and what I know this morning is God wants to pour out the oil of joy over his people. Come on, just say, I receive the oil of joy this morning. One more time, with a little louder, with everything you got, I receive the oil of joy this morning. 
God wants to pour out the oil of joy today in the hearts uh, of, his, uh, of us, in the hearts of his church. God wants to supernaturally build in us the oil of joy. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning for your word. We pray that, God, this morning it would become alive in us, Jesus, just as it became alive to those people in Nehemiah's day, Father. And, Lord, I pray and declare that in this house today there is going to be the oil of joy being poured out upon your people. God, we're not going to allow circumstances in our life to affect us, God, but, Lord, we are going to be people of joy, Lord, we are going to be a house filled with joy. And so, God, would you pour it out today? We say to you this morning, speak, for your servant is listening. No spirit, but the Holy Spirit this morning will, will be in this place. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me start off by giving you a definition of joy that I came across. I really like this definition. It says this, joy is unspeakable the light. Joy is unspeakable delight. It's not a what? A feeling, right? But a delight so deep, so rich, that words can't even describe it. Isn't that good? Psalm 45 7, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, so therefore, meaning because of this. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Some translations say the oil of joy. So because you love righteousness and hate wickedness, God has given you joy. Why? Because it's miserable being a follower of Jesus and walking in sin. It's miserable being a follower of Jesus and walking in sin. And let me just say, I thank God that the church is running a little low on the oil of joy, yeah? You ask someone, hey, how you doing? And they'll respond, and what you'll get is the, the spirit of Eeyore in their life. <laughs> you'll say to someone after church, but, uh, after today or, or before church, not after church because we're going to get changed, but before church, you might say, hey, how you doing? And they're like, oh, you know, Life, it's just so hard and so difficult, but you know what? I'm going to be okay. I'm going I'm to pick myself up. I'm going to make it. And what you get is just this downcast spirit. It's as though we've convinced ourselves that being miserable is extra credit when we get to heaven. <laughs> when we stand before Jesus, because think about it, you're literally going to stand before God one day. That he's going to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You were inc incredibly miserable your entire life. <laughs> That's not what he's going to say, is it? You see, the lack of joy in the life of the believer is evidence that something is off in the life of that believer. The lack of joy in the life of the believer is evidence that something is off in the life of the believer. This is how serious this topic is. Let me show you. Luke 2, 10 through 11. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. See, I bring you good news of great what? Joy. Come on. Great what? Joy. Great joy, which is for who? All people. Today, one who saves from the punishment of sin has been born in the city of David. He is the Christ. He is Christ the Lord. So help me understand, when we have news like that, when we under, really fully understand that the God who saves came to save us, when we have news like that, that we can be walking in the spirit of Eeyore around everywhere we go. No. That is not what God is calling his people to do. So when you ask me, Adam, how are you doing? I dare not measure what happened to me on that day or during my week. I only measure by what happened on that cross. Not on my circumstances, not on what I've faced, not on the challenges and the trials. I'm not talking about not being real, church. We need to be real with one another. 
with where we're at. I'm not talking about that. But if you ask me how I'm doing, I'm not going to measure by what happened in my day and by what happened in my week or my month or my year. I'm only going to measure by what Jesus did for me on that cross. And so when you ask me, Adam, how you doing? Man, the Lord has saved me. I know he's in control. I know his truth is more than all the lies have been spoken. I know that God is in control. And so I'm going to fully and completely trust my Savior. That's where it's at. But I get that some people get confused about joy and happiness, so let me just briefly compare happiness against joy, this eternal joy that is ours. Happiness can, can be found in the shallows, but joy is found in the depths. You can get happiness pretty easily by buying something, winning at a game. I get happy when I win at a game. It feels good, right? You get happiness in so many materialistic things, but what? Joy only comes and found in God in the depths. Here's another one. Happiness comes and goes, but joy remains. Happiness is situational, but joy is supernatural. It's supernatural. God is building in each one of you supernatural joy. He's building in you supernatural joy. And that's why it's unspeakable because it's not based on anything natural, anything which I can describe. This joy is unspeakable. My kids, uh, they are fascinated with money. I guess because I, I talk to them about it, I try to teach them about money. And they'll say to me, hey, Dad, do you do you make more money than Mr. Beast, who is a YouTuber, who's like the richest YouTuber? And I'm like, kids, absolutely not. Like, I definitely do not. Didn't you see, the, see our, like, this, this is not equivalent to Mr. Beast. Uh, he's, he, this is not equivalent to uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, for sure. But I'll tell them this. I'm like, I may not have as much money as they do, but, man, I'm richer than they are. I am richer than they are. And they might find out the key to eternal riches tomorrow, but right now, as it stands, I'm richer than they are. Because the God who owns everything, the God of the universe, he is my father, and I have his inheritance, and everything that he has is going to be mine. And so I don't measure my circumstances based on what is happening around me. I measure by what's happening on that cross because I am a son and a daughter. I'm a son of God. Many of you are sons and daughters of God, and he is calling you to understand that you are a son and you have an inheritance of eternal joy. And so you might say, Adam, when I look at your life and in, in in, in, in their lives, man, I would take their life over your life. But listen, we are sons and daughters of God. And when we have found the key to eternal joy, nothing else can replace it. Here's what that means. This inheritance we've been given as followers of Jesus is infinitely more joyous portion than the richest or most famous human being could ever possibly possess. You see, happiness is only present when the weather is perfect, but joy sings even louder in the middle of the storm. Just ask Paul and Silas. They were in the prison cell, but what were they doing? They were unfairly thrown into the prison cell. It didn't, they didn't deserve it by no means. But they were in prison and literally singing at the top of the lungs where everyone could hear them. Is that normal? No, it was only supernatural. And as that began to happen, the, the earthquake came and they were able to escape. But it was only because of this joy that was on the side of them that they were able to sing in the middle of their circumstance. True or false, isn't things going to get more difficult as Jesus, uh, we're nearing the Jesus return? Yeah. I was thinking about it this week. Isn't this a divine opportunity for the church? It shouldn't surprise us what is happening and going on. It shouldn't surprise us in the world when things become difficult. We hear wars and rumors of wars and everything is going on. But see, the people of God are called in that moment to have this supernatural joy within them. 
And people were like, hey, why are you singing? Why are you so joyful? Don't you see what's going on? Don't you see there's a war? Don't you see there's, there's famine? Don't you see? And you can say, listen, I know it sounds weird to many of you right now, but listen, I've got God with me and I trust him. And so I've got this joy through me say, man, I need what you got. You see, our joy is also evangelistic in nature. We have this unspeakable joy. It's an opportunity to show people that joy is only attainable when you are a child of God. It's only obtainable when you're a child of God. So you might be thinking, how do I get more of the oil of joy? How do I get this unspeakable joy you're talking about, Adam? Let me give you two things this morning. Number one, experiencing more of the oil of joy is a result of pleasing God. Experiencing more of the oil of joy is a result of pleasing God. Psalms 119, 55 through 57. I love this translation and how it reads. It says this, throughout the night, I think of you, dear God, I treasure your every word to me. All this joy, say joy. All this joy is mine as I follow your ways. You are my satisfaction. Lord, in all that I need, so I'm determined to do everything you say. I love that. I'm determined to do everything you say. You see, joy is the guaranteed result of knowing God is pleased. But one of the things that frustrates me about the enemy is it seems he's convinced many, and he's telling the lie that God is an angry God. Now, does God get angry? Yes, he does. But if it takes something to make him angry, it means there was a circumstance that happened to make him angry. But is he an angry God? Therefore, we can conclude that no, he's not an angry God. He's not an angry God. He loves you and he wants to be pleased with you and by you. And here's a good way of saying it. God's natural disposition toward you is pleasure not displeasure. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So how can you tell me, after reading that verse, that God is an angry God? If his pleasures are at his right hand. Not his anger is at his right hand, but what? His pleasure is at his right hand. You see, the fullness of joy is found in his presence forever. God is a God who absolutely, positively, totally, and completely loves being pleased by you. And inside the heart of every one of his children, God has placed the desire to please him. Philippians 2, 13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Think about it. Think about what this means. I'll personalize it for you. God looks in my direction. He says, Adam, I think you're pretty great. But listen, you've got some things that you need to work on in your life. Just as like you do. He thinks you're pretty great. But we all got some things that you need to work on in our life. Adam, you're pretty great. But you've got some things you need to work on in your life. And so as you surrender to me, what I'm going to do in your heart and in your life is I'm going to give you the desire in the power to please me. Isn't that good to know? God is going to give you the desire and the power to please him as you surrender everything you have to the Lord. So you cannot tell me that God is hard to please. He so wants to be pleased by you. So the question, the big question this morning, how do you experience more of the pleasure of God and therefore more of the oil of joy? Psalm 45, 7, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God... Your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Do you see how turning from your idols and turning from sin and giving everything you have to the Lord leads to joy in your life? It leads to pleasing the Lord. So how do you please God? You love righteousness and you hate wickedness. So point number two this morning, experiencing more of the oil of joy is a result of loving righteousness. Experiencing more of the oil of joy is a result of loving righteousness. You see, the absence of wickedness does not guarantee the presence of righteousness. 
It's one thing to hate wickedness. It's another thing to love righteousness. Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? All these things will be added unto you. Matthew 5. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus talked to his followers about having an overwhelming appetite to love the right thing. Why? Because he is the righteous one. When we love righteousness, it's one of the ways we're saying, I love you. This is who you are. This is what you're like. You know, uh, we all have different love languages, different ways that we feel and receive love. Uh, my wife, she, she receives love in different ways, but it doesn't matter if I tell her I love her. It doesn't matter. She, she does like that. I mean, of course she likes that. She needs to hear I love her, but she doesn't, she, she doesn't care if, if I, uh, uh, she, what she wants more than anything else is for me to do something, like do dishes or, or, or to do the yard or, or something like that. That is, she, she's thinking right now, that's, that is her love language. We all have different love languages, right? You tell me you love me, you tell me, you give me a hug and kiss, like that's all I need. I don't need the dishes done, I don't need anything else, like I don't really care. We all have different love languages. You understand what I'm saying? The way you love your spouse matters. The way we love God, it matters. If we love righteousness, it matters. It's not a salvation issue, but it does, however, dictate our level of joy, our level of peace, and the favor of God in our life. 1 John 3, 7 says this, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Little children, let me read it again. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. You know, I've told, um, I've told Ruth, my daughter, you're always going to be my little princess. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you're 15, 16. You're always going to be my little girl, you're always going to be my little princess. I don't care if you're 20, 30, 40, 60 years old. It does not matter to me. You're always going to be my child. Isn't that how God views us? Like, I know that many of us in this room were like, man, I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. But listen, God the Father views you as his child. You are a son and daughter of God. And when you understand that and you have this relationship with the father like that, don't you want to be like your father when it's a healthy relationship? I know for me, my relationship with, with Caleb, uh, my son, he's, he's, he's nine years old, um, he, uh, he just wants to be around me. He just wants to hang out with me. He just wants to, hey, dad, what are you doing? Like, what's going on right now? Like, hey, I'm going to help you fix something or I'm going to help you, which is not, it's pretty rare that I actually fix anything at all. If I try, it's going to break. I'm going to help you do this, or I'm going to go with you and do this, Dad. Like, I just want to be with you. I want to be like you, Dad. Like, I can see that in his life. He wants to be like me. And when we have that healthy relationship, that's how it should look with our father, our, earth, our earthly fathers as well. Maybe you didn't have a healthy relationship with your father, but that's what a healthy relationship looks like. But with our heavenly father, when we have a healthy relationship with him, what do we want to do? We just want to be like him, Right? And so what is our God like? He is holy. He is righteous. I'm going, to be, I'm going to love righteousness just like my dad. You see, the more you sense the pleasure of God, the more I believe you're going to see the windows of heaven open up and the oil of joy dumped all over you in every single area of your life. And here's what I want you to remember. Hear me on this. Lock in right now. Our God is so absolutely, positively, totally, and completely in love with being pleased by you. That he's made it where you are, the, are one of the things that he is most pleased with. Reject the lie of the enemy. You already have the favor of God. 
There's nothing you can do to earn it. As a son and daughter of God, if you've, if you've made that decision, you already have the favor of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can you imagine what life would look like if the church wasn't just trying to earn the favor of God to do whatever it took to hear, well done, you good and faithful servant. But you've already earned the favor. You've already earned it. But they started waking up every single day and say, Dad, what do you have for me today? Where are you leading me? Where are you guiding me? What do you want me to do today? What if we woke up every single day instead of trying to prove ourselves, just walking with our Father in our life? Here's the thing in life right now, many of us in this room, there's this weight, there's this heaviness that we're trying to carry. Have you ever said to yourself before, man, I wish I'd go back to being 12 years old again, five years old, whatever it was, but I had no responsibility and everything was taken care of. Things would be just so much easier. I've said that before. Man, to be, have no responsibility again, what an incredible privilege, an incredible thing that would be. But listen, as a son and daughter of God, God sees you as just a little kid, as just his child. And the pressure is off. When you wake up every single day and say, Father, what do you have for me today? Father, where are you leading me? Where are you guiding me? Lord, what do you want to do in my life today? What happens is that, man, the pressure is off. And what is it like to be a kid with no pressure? Isn't there this joy that begins to happen in your life? Like you look at kids and are like, man, they're just so happy. They're just having fun, running around, laughing, and because they have no pressure, they have no responsibility. Listen, we have responsibility in our life, but listen, the pressure is off, church. We can trust the Lord. We make things so complicated, but if we just understand that we are sons and daughters of God, the pressure is off, and we can just trust our Father. You don't have to worry. You can live life full of joy as you hate wickedness and you love righteousness. I want to close in this as the band begins to come up the stage. This is what I, the Lord's been kind of giving me just this word for where we're at for about a month now. I felt like there's been an onslaught of attacks from the enemy towards leadership here at the church, towards individuals here at the church, towards this church in general, because God is pleased with us. He's pleased with our hearts, and he has great plans for us. But what happens is Satan sees the great plans that God has for us, so he's going to do everything he possibly can to ruin everything that is happening and what God wants to do in this house. And so he's going to come and he's going to, he's, going to, uh, he's going to throw lies out. He's going to attack where he can. He's going to uh, make things difficult and hard. Why? To distract us from what our purpose is and what God is calling us into. And what I believe and what I know this morning, I feel like this is timely, is what the Lord wants to do is he wants to release the oil of joy over this house. That no longer are we going to be bound in our circumstances, no longer will we be bound in what the enemy is trying to do. We're going to say, man, greater is he that's in us and he's in the world. I reject that. I reject the, the difficulty. I, I reject the distraction. And I'm going to keep my attention. I'm going to keep my focus right now on the Father. And I'm going to allow the oil of joy, despite anything that's going on in my life, to what? To be my strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Psalm says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Come on, are you ready to put on the garment of praise? Are you ready to receive the oil of joy in this room this morning? This is, this is the verse that the Lord gave me with this, Psalm 126, 5. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. You might have sown some tears over the past few months, but I'm telling you this morning, God wants you to reap joy this morning. He wants to pour out the oil of joy. Would you stand to your feet right now? No longer is the spirit of Eeyore going to be at work in this house this morning. No longer are we going to be people who have the spirit of Eeyore. We're not going to be depressed. We're not going to be downcast. Psalm says, why are you downcast, oh my soul? 
put your what? Your hope in God. What are you going to do? We're going to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness.